Oops, careful. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Laura Donardis. Uh, Professor Donardis is Associate Dean in the School of Communications at American University in Washington, uh, D.C. And uh, she's not only a communication scholar, she has background in information uh, engineering. So, please, stand up. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be at Cyber Week and joining this privacy panel. The title of my remarks is Privacy Complications of Cyber Physical Systems. As a backdrop to my remarks, I wanted to mention the conceptual framework of all of my research. People describe me as an internet governance scholar. And the basic thesis of my work is that arrangements of technical architecture are also arrangements of power. So I study the politics of the things uh, that you can't see when using the internet, like systems of interconnection, routing, protocols, addressing, and really the things that keep the internet operational behind the scenes and the enactment of substantive policy around that. So as mentioned, I do study this from three different perspectives. One is a background uh, professionally and educationally in information engineering but also um, a doctorate in science and technology studies, and I spent five years at Yale Law School at the Information Society Project. So um, I really am an interdisciplinary uh, scholar that looks at infrastructure. But the main point that I'd like to make today, and I think I have really time for one point today, is from my new book that I'm working on about rethinking internet freedom and governance in the age of cyber control. And that point, the primary thesis is that the internet is no longer a communication network. It's a control network in which more things than people are connected and in which infrastructure control is now a proxy for political power. Control is not, uh, excuse me, the cyberspace therefore is not just a discursive public sphere connecting people and content. It's a pervasive background infrastructure that connect, connects cars and wearable technologies, home appliances, drones, biological systems, currency, and really every conceivable industry sector. So there's a diffusion of boundaries between offline and between virtual and physical spaces that is very, very relevant to public policy and how we look at internet governance. The real world connected by digital systems also includes currency, cryptocurrencies. It includes manufacturing processes, as you've all so eloquently described. And definitely the body is now part of this space. If you think about cardiac implants that are connected, biological systems related to um, medical monitoring, biometric identification devices, these things really create a new set of technology policy concerns particularly around privacy and the connection between privacy now and human safety. So if you think about how the internet or an outage of the internet is no longer about disrupting my ability to email someone or access knowledge or really nothing about content, it's about losing day-to-day -day functioning in the real world. This raises the stakes over how cyber infrastructure is designed and governed, including, of course, around uh, privacy. A recent, or really a number of recent incidents help us to understand this. Uh, some of you may remember one day last fall when some um, popular websites, including Amazon and Reddit, went down because of a massive DDoS attack. The outage really did, in the United States at least, receive a lot of public attention and a lot of media attention because of the high profile nature of the sites that went down. But from the standpoint of what I study, what was much more interesting to me were some alarming characteristics. First, and like other attacks, they weren't actually attacks on the sites. They disrupted the uh, infrastructure of the internet, and in this case, the domain name system, and even more specifically, a company that does manage domain name system services. 
So this is um, actually the subject of my last book, The Turn to Infrastructure and Internet Governance, that the infrastructure of the internet is the place where all control is happening. The second characteristic of this is just how massive it was. As the chief strategy officer of the affected infrastructure company described it, tens of millions of IP addresses across multiple attack vectors and internet locations were involved, but more, much more consequential for uh, this talk and for the future of the internet, they were carried out by hijacking home IoT devices like digital video recorders and security cameras. These were um, trivial to infect, as this crowd well knows, because they had known security vulnerabilities in, or in some cases weak or no passwords at all. So the Internet of Things is not only a potential target, but it's also a potential attack vector where security incidents can arise and where privacy can be massively complicated. Now these trends help shed light on emerging global geopolitical cyber policy issues in this diffusion of the physical and the virtual worlds. Cybersecurity, of course, is uh, the most obvious uh, it area, but also uh, the, the enormous scale and uh, reach of IoT deployments. It creates a lot of challenges around critical internet resources, not just spectrum, but also IP addresses. Um, I actually, a long time ago, wrote my doctoral dissertation on IPv6. I can't believe it's still not um, <clears throat> globally spread. Um, there are resource constraints that arise in this area. And human safety is a cyber issue now. So attacks can cause a disruption of a medical device or a malfunction of a car, or as Yuval was describing, this additive manufacturing, another uh, great example of how this bleeds into the real world. A major policy issue is the question of accountability and who has responsibility for outages, upgrades, and the insurance of basic human safety in this environment. And I would also mention that uh, cyber conflict, already a concern, is much more of a concern when you think about how this bleeds into real world, world devices. We've had examples of this for years. Uh, but what counts as um, the threat matrix? What counts as the types of foreign surveillance that are possible? And the disruptions that can occur expands widely. But relevant to this panel, privacy. Tech policy, and I live inside, well, I live so far inside of Washington, I hardly ever drive more than a mile. So I can tell you that the tech policy communities haven't really caught up to this privacy challenge in the material diffusion of the Internet of Things, where data is not just collected about our communications, but collected about what we do in all areas of our life. Now, corporate data surveillance that's taking place in this sphere is much more massive, it's much more pervasive, it's much more invasive, because it, we're not even aware of the ambient data collection that can occur through things like televisions and uh, different kinds of control devices that we have in our homes and in our cars. Now this data gathering in the corporate sphere, of course, um, is the reason that there, there can be a lot more government surveillance. What data is gathered and how is it used? How is it retained? I'm looking at the privacy policies where there are some of these kinds of companies that provide the cyber physical systems and it's really unclear, there's not as much transparency. To what extent is it personalized and anonymized? Is data encrypted in transit and at rest? These are very complicated issues that are evolving. Consent is very complicated in this area. Opt-out is complicated. How do you do consent with no screen? People who don't even buy the products can be caught up with the ambient data gathering. So uh, privacy is very, very um, complicated, and there are not necessarily sufficient market incentives for companies to build in certain kinds of um, protections for privacy. The rush to come to market is a challenge. We want to incentivize innovation, but how do you do this and also have security and privacy? Now, considering the broader 
use of infrastructure as a proxy for power geopolitically, and in light of how the IoT systems are both a target and also an attack vector, cyber physical systems are the emerging sphere in which geopolitical cyber conflict will play out. And what raises the stakes considerably is how this relates to human safety. So the rationale for my new book is to reconceptualize human rights in this environment and to reconceptualize tech policy around this diffusion and enmeshment of the internet into the material world and in light of the geopolitical context in which infrastructure is increasingly politicized. So a few um, provocations that uh, seem very obvious, but in policy circles, they are not necessarily. One is that we have to think about all firms as tech firms now. Technology policy has to expand notions of what counts as a technology company. Making a distinction between tech companies and non-tech companies no longer makes any sense, and doing so is actually detrimental to our understanding of human rights and tech policy. The same types of civil liberties questions that are, arise when we look at large content intermediaries like Google and Facebook and other kinds of intermediaries have to apply to the personal data collection and even more so in these contexts, blending the virtual and the material. Many of the firms that are now suddenly also digital technology companies don't have as much experience with cybersecurity in the public facing component or with dealing with privacy. And conversely, those who address policy concerns sometimes continue to focus on content intermediaries rather than these real world digital intermediaries. So the changing nature of firms has to be a backdrop of technology policy in the immediate future. And as discussed uh, quite a bit at this conference, um, I would suggest that cybersecurity, considering some of these trends, is the great human rights issue of our time. It's not just about freedom of expression, democracy, and privacy of content, but it's about basic human safety now. So some researchers easily demonstrated the ability to wirelessly connect to a car and disrupt the, baking, the braking system and the acceleration system by um, hacking into the car's emergency communication system. We saw Yuval's example of the drone uh, propeller blade, which I loved. We, ha we know, um, and I you know, constantly monitor the safety warnings that come out of various government agencies. One that caught my eye recently was from the US Food and Drug Administration. They issued a safety warning about cybersecurity vulnerabilities in the radio frequency enabled implantable cardiac monitors. And we know that democracy also now depends on cybersecurity. When you think about, for example, the Russian hacking of personal email accounts belonging to US political institutions and individuals during this last presidential election. So privacy and security was related to democracy. <coughs> I'm an internet governance scholar and I describe the mantra of internet governance just like everyone else in my field. It's multi-stakeholder. That's one of the things that we always say. Distributed in a decentralized way. <clears throat> the, one of the goals of internet governance is to preserve a universal internet. We have to call into question all of these standard internet governance philosophical positions in light of the human safety concerns that arise in this sphere. What is an intermediary in the Internet of Things environment? So we have a lot of um, uh, approaches to immunity from liability for information intermediaries, but what is the liability, what does the liability landscape need to look like for the intermediaries that are not sending content between humans, but sending content between manufacturing devices or medical systems, et cetera? And in, under what conditions should they be liable for the data that passes through them when it affects not only freedom of expression, but also someone's life? There are enormous, enormous risks around um, liability um, in this space. How do, 
how can we have liability and also have innovation? So that is something that needs to have more attention outside of the content intermediaries and into these physical intermediaries that are now completely digitized. Complicating this issue is the role of artificial intelligence in risk determinations. At some point, there's going to have to be a decision in a driverless car. Um, as people always say, do you hit the stroller or do you kill the passenger in the car? I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit. But those are decisions that will be split second and made in art artificial intelligence. So how do you, who's accountable for these decisions? Another question that relates to internet governance is how does multi-stakeholder governance apply? It may be time to rethink that description of how policy works in the cyber sphere because there are certain areas here uh, like traffic management systems. Should that be multi-stakeholder where civil society has input as well as governments, as well as pr the private sector? I think more than ever before, there will have to really think about the layered approach to what the different services are in this environment and where is it appropriate for governments to have authority, where is it appropriate for the private sector to have authority, and where are these spaces that really should be more of shared governance agreements. And one final challenge to internet governance is um, I've, I, I even have a book on open standards. I've spent my whole life working on interoperability and trying to have a universal internet. But in this particular space, fragmentation has some desirable effects. Privacy in this space is similar to cybersecurity, that sometimes the only firewall to having human safety protected is having some lack of interoperability between systems. So we have to rethink where fragmentation can be applied as a solution to some of the privacy and cybersecurity issues that arise and not just always say we need an open and universal, universal and free internet, but where do we need to have fragmentation that helps to preserve human liberty that includes security. So my book is, um, I'm really very happy to have a chance to be speaking about it. I'm working on um, the research. I've been working on this book for a while. It's going to be published next year with Yale University Press. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm thinking about the internet as a control network for the physical world rather than as a communication network. And I'm using this as a provocation to both see the infrastructure and make it visible and to reimagine the politics that are embedded in this infrastructure so that we can have internet freedom that includes basic human stability and security. Thank you very much for listening.